Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now, we started this programme in January. Since then I've interviewed about 25 people. Uh, but it's a very particular and very important time for us because we have just passed the one million views mark. So I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you very much to all those people who have watched. I hope you continue watching. And also to those people who have subscribed to the channel and indeed to those of you who've sent donations because they are extremely important to us. We really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Because this is a landmark, it's particularly important that we have an especially eminent distinguished guest. I'm glad to say that today I'm joined by the philosopher Sir Roger Scruton. Sir Roger has been a dogged defender and promoter of conservatism and conservative ideas over 50 years. He's the author of 50 books on philosophy, religion, art, politics, sexuality, and music. And he's with me now. Thank you very, very much for coming, well, uh, thank Sir you Roger. For um, I think that some congratulations are in order because you've just been awarded the Polish Order of Merit, have you not? Yes, exactly. Now, does this relate to the work you did in Eastern Europe? Yes, th this was uh, you, just uh, a week or so ago, there was the 30th anniversary of the free, uh, first free elections that took place in Poland, first free elections after the communist uh, collapse in Eastern yeah. Europe. Um, and so there was a big celebration for this and they singled me out as someone who was symbolically important because I'd been involved. Uh, but m my involvement was not at all um, overt or, 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 or well known. I, I spent my a lot of time in those days making contacts among the underground in yeah. Poland, Czechoslovakia and Hungary and um, putting people into relation with their Western colleagues, taking them materials, giving them talks as well, you know, because they, they were completely uh, uh, out of their depth when it came to uh, trying to understand the geopolitical situation. Nobody had ever explained to them yeah. that there was such a thing as conservatism or a, a liberal current of opinion within socialism and all that. So yes. we, we had a very, I and a lot of colleagues had a very good time um, going around to the places where people had got together to, to educate themselves. Yes. Uh, and that's something I've always believed in, that, that, that s civil society consists of those little platoons that Burke recommends to us. They, they, those platoons had all been uh, uh, abolished in Eastern Europe, yet people were trying, groping their way mm. towards mm. them again. So um, it was very inspiring to, you know, to visit the places where they were and help people to set themselves on their feet. Um, it wasn't safe, of course. I was going to say, it must have been uh, dangerous. Or well, it, it was. But one was followed often. And, uh, you know, but I, I went on getting a visa to go in to Poland right to the end, not to Czechoslovakia. I was arrested there. But, but um, you know, as long as you were careful and prepared things properly, mm. uh, we, were, we were always a, <laughs> a step in advance of the secret police because it was a time when everything was changing. You know, we had computers, they had only just begun to envisage a computer. You yeah. know, we even had among our underground contacts somebody who had produced the first software for the Czech language. Mm -hmm. So we had that before the secret police had. So, uh, so there was quite a, you know, a difference in, the, in technological availability for us. Um, but it, yeah, it, it wasn't safe but for that very reason it was uh, there was something inspiring because you, mm. you knew that whoever you were talking to was taking a risk yes so you so talking to you was more important to him than the possibility of uh, you know of six months in in jail isn't that really rather like english academia now <laughs> well, <laughs> i have to say i have been distressed to see the parallel mm. um, uh, when i first went to czechoslovakia in 1979, this was uh, um, after the uh, Charter 77 movement, uh, which had tried briefly to establish relations with the West of an open kind. Uh, all my colleagues in the university who had signed the Charter were either 
uh, still in jail or anyway not allowed to teach. They'd be, they were doing menial jobs, sweeping streets or stoking boilers. Uh, and um, one of the most important uh, procedures that had been used against them was the, dun the denunciatory letter. Right. They, they would, uh, uh, their colleagues in their department would find a letter on their desk one morning uh, issued by the secret police denouncing a particular colleague for having signed the charter or for having associated p with people who did yeah. uh, 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 and accusing him of subversion of the republic in co collaboration with foreign powers and all this sort of thing uh, and asking for a signature from the, the person on whose desk it was uh, to um, add his name to the call for this person to be dismissed. Mm, right. uh, and that's what we're seeing in exactly. universities yeah. here now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, letters of denunciation formulated by uh, totalitarian students who've got no conception of, of recent history, uh, don't read books, but are full of a kind of undigested venom towards the world of culture into which they should be Want longing to incorporate themselves, but for some reason they can't do it, and they see these professors with old-fashioned views, you know, who who might not have the absolutely up-to-date vision of uh, of whatever it is as the issue of the day, transgenderism or whatever it might mm, be, mm. and uh, so he's ripe for denunciation. And we've seen this with several cases recently, and the university. Um, Many of the universities just capitulate <coughs> and say, yeah, well, that's, that's his fault. And I think you've referred to this recently, but uh, it's possibly the kind of death, isn't it, of universities? Well, if, it, if it's not stopped, it will, it will be the death, certainly, of, uh, of humanities departments. Mm -hmm. I think in the sciences it will still, you know, people yeah. will still go on. But, but science, when, as it were, isolated from the rest of culture, becomes a very dreary thing mm, mm. and people become alienated from it. You know, all the great scientists of our time, if you look back at Einstein and, uh, you know, and, uh, and Freud and Piaget and all those people, they were highly cultivated people. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, th for them, the, their intellectual development could never have been confined to something like a laboratory. Mm. It, it was uh, a, a form of dialogue with, with civilization as a whole. And if that goes, I mean, it hasn't gone because I know some wonderfully um, cultivated scientists mm. today, but um, if the humanities departments are taken out of universities, that's a very a great loss to science as well. You mentioning uh, Eastern Europe there, you said, I think recently that, uh, you know, Eastern European countries, Hungary, Czech Republic, are our natural friends, yes. much more than maybe the others. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, certainly the impression one had so traveling then, of course I was traveling among mm. dissidents and mm. people had taken, mm. taken risks to stand up for something, but the impression one had was that there was a, a great admiration for the British experience and that we had to some extent established ourselves as a role model mm -hmm. for, for stable government in a changing world. And our Conservative Party was much admired, partly for Mrs. Thatcher's strength of character, mm -hmm. of course. Um, but it was really quite inspiring for me to be able to, to associate myself with this country's resilience and, and yeah. firmness against the whole uh, Soviet expansion. Whether that exists now is another question, but it, it did exist then in the late 1970s. And um, I think had we worked harder than we have done, those countries would have been uh, our natural allies in our long-term conflict with the European Union. Yeah, yes, exactly. Speaking of which, to come right up today, you mentioned there that the Conservative Party maybe was quite resilient then under Thatcher. Yes. When you, when you look at now, we're recording this during the full throttle, if you yes. like, of the leadership campaign of the Tory mm. Party. When you look at that now, what do you, sort of take from from it when you look at the personalities involved and the issues and the way they're expressed i mean what does it what does it say about the general state of conservatism very good question you know i've always been worried about the general state of conservatism because as an intellectual i think it ought to have proper philosophical foundations mm. and i look for those foundations and i don't really see them very 
clearly mm. in practical politics. Mm. Of course, in the tradition, in, in, in the history, yes, you have Burke and, and Hegel and de Maistre and all those people in the Romantic period and what followed in the 19th century. All that is very inspiring, but um, I don't think it has much impact on mm. the Conservative Party. Uh, I mean, the Conservative Party has always been suspicious of intellectuals anyway, uh, on the perfectly good ground that intellectuals think, and thinking is dangerous. You, you know, you might come up with a wrong idea. <laughs> so <laughs> the Conservative Party has always been very, you know, uh, yes. demure about it. Yeah. Uh, but now I think it's that that lack of uh, of a proper thought through basis to their worldview is beginning to show, mm. uh, because that's precisely what was needed in the whole Brexit thing, mm. a sense of, of what and who and where we are mm. as a nation mm. in, the, I in this confrontation with the global forces which we can't avoid. Uh, where do we put our flag, so to speak, in, in what territory and how? Uh, how do we respond to all the changes brought about by F mass migration and of course especially migration from Eastern Europe. Mm. Uh, anybody in his senses in Poland has his eye on coming here. Um, mm. Although I, I'm glad to say that the Polish economy is picking up and there's, all a, right. there's a big beginnings of a movement the other way. Uh, but um, all these things we know are, are hugely, hugely difficult and um, it's certainly a, a case where having some conception of mm. what our country is and where its values and its future come from was necessary. You, you mentioned there, Mrs. Thatcher, the battles seem to be largely economic. I'm a bit speaking very broadly, broadly here. Mm. But you mentioned there too about you know, what we are, who we are, where we are. Um, you would define conservatism, wouldn't you, as being that is the essence of it in a way, and and, and a love of that, yes. and wanting to preserve it. Is yes. that right? Yes, um, the first principle of uh, politics for a conservative, in my view, I is that uh, politics is concerned with belonging. Mm. Uh, we have a particular community which belongs in a place, mm. but also in a in a tradition, in in a political framework. And with it and belongs in expectations and so on. All these are things which unite people in a first person plural as a we and unite us to a place. Uh, and we've always assumed that. Uh, and if you don't assume that, you have a real problem about how you deal with people who don't agree with you. Mm. You know, um, and this is something w w was very clearly seen in the 20th century when. Um, the communists and the Nazis uh, declared that that um, you know th that, that there can be no opposition mm. because you've now got the right solution. Um, but uh, and then they looked around for what the opposition, where it might be, and of course it, it was then hidden. It was then the enemy within and had to be destroyed. Mm. But but in a democracy, if you recognise that that we live among people who disagree with us but attached to the same place mm. and the same historical uh, inheritance, we can then all say, you know, let's ag agree to disagree. But we still have this, which is more important yeah, yeah. than what we believe, this thing which is ours, to, which belongs to us, and we belong to it. That, to me, is what the Conservative Party has always emphasised in the past, and one reason for its great electoral success. Mm. And it sort of suddenly has ceased to do so. It's lost confidence, partly because it's frightened of the left. As soon as you start saying these sort of things that I've just said to mm, you, mm. which are, in my view, quite harmless and also true, mm. uh, you get accused of these uh, uh, thought crimes mm. that have suddenly become dominant, you know, because you're, you're wanting to exclude people. You're wanting to, to mm. attach yourself to a, some kind of uh, primitive you know, uh, supremacist mm -hmm. uh, vision of what your own co community is, which of course is not, not true at all. You know when you say, uh, you're talking about the 80s, that there was a sense in which we could disagree or whatever, but we, we all had this, as yes. it were. Okay. Uh, I think it's true to say, isn't it, that things, that was more intact then than now? It, of course it was more intact, and that's part of what we're going through, is a recognition that that, that 
the fabric that holds all that together has been torn. Mm. Um, but uh, again, I think there's a lesson to be learned from the East European experience. If you ask yourself, why was it that communism finally collapsed? Th there wasn't any external force um, uh, causing it to do so. It collapsed largely because the Poles woke up to their sense of national identity. They, they started saying, we are an entity other than the Communist Party, yes. and we're going to affirm that. And thanks to the election of Jean Paul, uh, Jean -Paul II, you know, to the papacy, of mm. course, they had the added boost from their religious inheritance. Mm. Uh, and uh, you know, we all need that, mm. and, and it shouldn't be demonized, but the, but the left has had a, a real attempt at demonizing it so that we have the Conservative Party is afraid to confess to what it knows to be true. Yes. You uh, come from a quite humble background, don't you, originally? Yes. It's, it wasn't, it didn't have sort of future eminent Conservative philosopher sort of printed all over it, did it? Absolutely. Um, but was it a political family? Was it a well, my father was very political. Uh, he was a Labour Party a member and a trade union member as well. Uh, he, uh, he belonged to the National Union of, Tre of Teachers and, and he was the local secretary of his branch and uh, you know, he took it very seriously. Um, uh, he, and he was a bit of a class warrior, a product of the, um, uh, of the Manchester slums who remained through all his life loyal to that deprived background and wanting on the best of grounds for the situation of people I in the um, industrial working class to be improved, they they mm. need they should have their share mm. of what, of the of the beauty of this countryside, for instance, mm. uh, and the wealth that it produced. And it was a very noble uh, uh, approach to things, very much that of the old Labour Party, mm. which was not about uh, you know uh, taking over the entire economy and turning it in a collectivist direction. Although unfortunately after the war, you know, all the Clause 3 stuff came in and, and it did move in that direction. Mm. But, mm. Um, but he, he wasn't a collectivist of that kind, but he did want things to be distributed more fairly. Yes. And, um, and um, he had a, a visceral dislike of the upper class and um, how did that manifest itself? <laughs> just unable, inability to tolerate their existence <laughs> and just sneering at the radio whenever they were mentioned or <laughs> anybody appeared on the radio speaking with what was then the correct BBC yeah, accent yeah, yeah. when people uh, talked correctly. Uh, yeah, he, was, um, he would bang his fist on the table and he, uh, anyway, um, not, that was not pleasant. And uh, I, at the time, um, w w his anger against the upper class uh, it, uh, really inspired me to investigate them. Mm. You know, I thought, well, gosh, these people, they, they really sound interesting. Are they, are they that poisonous? <laughs> Let's have a look. <laughs> what did, was there a particular point at which, or was it a gradual thing that you formulated your conservatism or your your world view was there a, did something happen or or, or, or did it mm. just gradually emerge well everybody's in a state of flux uh, and I'm no different from everybody else but but there was the crucial moment of 1968 in Paris yeah. where not where I was at the time I was um, had left university and been teaching in the college universitaire in Pau um, and I was there in May in, in Paris, borrowed a flat from a friend and, and saw what was going on and I was outraged by it, mm. you know, the, the, the smashing of things by these uh, incredibly well-heeled students in their Maoist uniforms, you know, I, 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 it occurred to me what on earth do they think they're going to put in the mm, place mm. of this wonderful city of Paris, of France, of the culture and history of France. Mm. Where is it? Where are they going to get it from? And there was no answer to that. And of course, I started reading all the destructive literature that that, that had influenced them, in particular Foucault and Althusser and so on. And that really turned me against the sort of uh, 
Marxist orthodoxy that was beginning to take over the yeah. student world in the, in the uh, late 60s. And then I, I went back to Cambridge to do research and you know, there I met uh, you know, robust people who, who, mm -hmm. who hadn't gone down the Marxist line and I thought, well in that case one doesn't have to. And I started thinking things through and really got interested in, you know, in the question, what is the alternative? Does it apply to the society in which we are now? And where are its intellectual roots? Mm. Um, so I, I became, you know, a, a sort of known in the academic world as someone prepared to defend conservatism mm. in that way. Well, if we're talking that's 1968, we're now 2019, so like yeah. 51 years. Yes. Uh, you've been defending conservatism during that whole time. You have often, you know, ploughed a lonely furrow, yes. it's true to say. Um, what, and you've had lots of hostility. Um, yes. What keeps you going in, that, in the face of that as a man? Well, uh, you're right to ask that question because I have gone through moments uh, of depression, mm. actually. But, um, but I've always had the hope that there are others who are thinking likewise, and I've always had the good fortune to meet them. And, um, and for the most part, the hostility has been the kind that you can deal with as, as long as you, are, you have another circle of your own. Mm. So I, I'm, uh, I was very lonely at certain times, but my involvement in Eastern Europe cheered me up no end because, right. I, because I recognized then that all those things I disliked in the academic Marxism that was emerging around me had actually been put into practice and had shown how, how not uh, how inefficient they were but how evil they were mm. you know entering that world where everyone was in a state of fear Mm. Nobody trusted anyone. There was a sense of the omnipresent eye observing you mm. without knowing whose eye it was. All that was very creepy and, and, uh, and it got into my soul, mm. uh, to be quite honest. And I thought, uh, uh, even if I'm hated for what I write, I've got to write in such a way as to show how destructive of the human norm that is of, of a human personality mm. and I still think uh, that you know that, that I still long for my, the, the, the great book which will pin it down and say yeah, well, yeah. this should never happen again <laughs> unfortunately yeah. um, but of course I got to know the literature and um, there's nobody who's read Miwash's ca Captive Mind uh, or Solzhenitsyn of course uh, can can have any doubts about it, mm. but uh, unfortunately, we are entering a period of illiteracy in which people don't read those books. Yeah, yeah. I mean, w one of the most recent, you know, uh, hostilities you faced, or rather, difficulties you faced, was when um, they put an end to your position when you you had been appointed by the Conservative government to be yes. head of the beautiful building housing committee. Yeah. That's that right, and because of a, an interview which seems to have been a new low in outrageous distortion. Mm. Um, you were asked to leave, whatever. Um, what was that like? Well, actually, that, that was very disturbing because I thought whatever the, the um, attacks on me, the Conservative Party surely is my place of refuge. Mm -hmm. And they must see that um, I'm standing up for the things that they ought to be standing mm. up for, and I was pleased that they appointed me to this commission. Mm. Because unusual. Uh, unusual, yes, yeah. and it was a difficult commission to, mm. to advocate for mm. beauty mm. in a world that's dominated by uh, utilitarian architecture. Mm. You know, that's, that, that's, that's tough, uh, and it required a lot of work and a lot of diplomacy. But the interesting thing is that when, as you say, I gave an interview at my publisher's request, I didn't ask for it to the to the new statesman. I thought it was going to be about my philosophy and so on. Uh, and they sent this uh, journalist, of um, obviously of uh, uh, animated by a very strong hostility to, to <laughs> me, mm. put it mildly, who who uh, 
essentially fabricated the interview from, a, from my discourse. Yes. Uh, and um, by taking bits out of context, uh, uh, adjusting other bits, and all the usual stuff, but um, ad addressing it in, in, in effect to the social media mob, mm. uh, um, asking them, or inviting them to join in, in, um, in character assassination. And uh, th the effect of it, of course, was the whole press came in mm. on this mm. because uh, um, it looked like a jolly good story. And the Conservative Party joined in instead of. Uh, I wasn't even asked to um, explain. Mm. I, I learned. Uh, as I was on a train at the time. I learned I'd been dismissed mm. peremptorily by the um, minister concerned, um, and um, that was it. And it was, uh, uh, you know, it was typical of this uh, panic that, uh, that uh, the Conservatives feel uh, at the witch hunting that goes on on the left they mm. don't want to be the next one if someone is if someone is being scapegoated you must pick up your own stone and throw it at him otherwise you'll be the next one it's exactly the same as that I talked about the yeah. uh, with letters of denunciation yes exactly yes um, I remember with one particular of the Tory MPs I think there were about three Tory MPs mm. won't name them but uh, one of them um, who, who went for you and and it sort of seemed to me, actually, what it really showed also was the level of philistinism, oh, yeah. actually, because I got the impression, and I mean this with the greatest respect, that I, I got the impression he didn't quite know who you even were. I'm, yes. I'm thinking in particular of uh, yes. Johnny Mercer. Yeah, you know, no, I, and I, talking I, about intellectualism, so somehow this was a yeah. bad thing. Yeah. You know? No, I think he, he, I think he was out of his depth. I, I, I didn't follow all the things that were no, said no. because it was all too upsetting. No, yeah. um, but I had the great good fortune that Douglas Murray I saw. Uh, uh, stepped in uh, and relentlessly interrogated the new statesman about it until it be until finally somebody managed to get hold of the tape of the interview, send it to me anonymously, and we recognised that I hadn't said any of these things or what if there were phrases that were that were phrases I'd used I'd used them in a completely different exactly. context and all, uh, and I think. Now, I think there will be an apology about it uh, um, from, the, from the paper. I know the editor was mortified by the whole thing, um, and that's good. Um, before we leave this particular uh, uh, topic, um, I suppose that you know, this is an important part in what we call our culture wars, I guess. It was an important in, in, in instance of it. Um, I suppose that you could say there would be a uh, would have been a, a some sort of victory in the culture wars if they had said actually we were wrong please we would yes. like you to take it back. Yeah. If they did that, would you have taken it back? Um, I think if it had come at the right time, I would mm. in order to help them over yeah. their embarrassment. Right. Okay. I would, Very I big of you. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have wanted it back because the reason why I got these attacks that they they'd happened already. Uh, is that the architectural establishment is deeply hostile to my being yes, in that yes, position yes. because they know, they know that I will say the things that they don't want to hear and they don't want the public to hear. Mm. Namely, that the kind of templates used in our cities and in our countryside today by the, the average modern architect are deeply repugnant to the ordinary mm. person. Mm. Uh, and that's why ordinary people fight a planning battles and prevent us from building and the, the architectural schools need to wake up to this and uh, we need to arm the public against them and I was going to say that so th they will always stop me saying that yes. and they'll use any weapon because there's a this is a huge vested interest with a great deal of money behind it yes. and a great deal of political connection especially with the Tory party mm. and um, so were you you were surprised in some ways maybe by your point, which is anyone else? Absolutely, <laughs> I thought that I thought these, the Conservative Party had uh, was now uh, must be going through a crisis because it was insane enough to appoint someone who believed what it ought to be believing. Mm, mm. Um, you know, uh, on the whole, the Conservative Party has survived by aiming to be still in place at the next election uh, and doing whatever is necessary to be there. You, you were talking about, it was called Building Beautiful, wasn't yes, it? Yes, right. You yeah. talked uh, a lot about beauty, you've written about beauty, there's a book on beauty, mm. and you did a TV programme on beauty, which I, I loved, I watched it. 
it's required viewing, I think. Um, mm. But the upshot of what you say in that, it seems to me, is that we are either afraid of beauty now, or we have sort of banished the whole idea of beauty. So before yes. I ask you, I was just asking, what would you call beauty? In architecture or art? Mm. Oh, I, I think what I would say is the most important aspect of beauty is that we are at home with it. Right. Um, and that's even when it shocks us or, or challenges us, you know, um, some, uh, just go back to the, you know, the great challenging works of art mm. like, like Picasso's, you, you know, um, uh, early, well, middle period stuff or Stravinsky, uh, uh, mm. uh, the Stravinsky ballets, especially the Rite of Spring, or even some of the striking um, architectural people like Letherby and, and so on mm. at the turn of the century. Um, that there, you know, whatever we think about it, we stand back after a while and we think, yes, I can bring this into my life, yeah. and it is part of me, and it's inviting me to yeah. do to be part of it, yeah. uh, and I and it part of me. And that invitation is, I think, essential to our sense of beauty. Uh, and in ordinary life, you know, we don't we're not aesthetes. Most most of us, we don't go around the world looking for the the sublime experience that you can get from. And the, the Shakespeare sonnets or Tristan Isolde or whatever, we, we go around the world wanting to find the places w where we could be. Mm. Uh, uh, places which don't repel us, which don't mm. say go away, mm. uh, which on the contrary open some kind of inner door. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think that's what everyday beauty is like. And we all, we're all able to produce it. Mm. When we're given a room of our own and a bit of furniture, we start arranging it so that it is like that, so that we belong and it belongs. And I think that is what the instinct for beauty is and why it's absolutely necessary for us and more necessary today than it's ever been before, precisely because it's so rare mm. and also because the, the surrounding world is dominated by utilitarian mm. culture. Mm. Everything is conceived in functional terms, mm. as a means to an end. Certainly you see that in architecture. You know, it's all straightforward, simple engineering devices to, uh, for, to perform a particular function, but which don't have any ability to put the surrounding people at ease with them. But you made the point, actually, and I thought it was an excellent point in the, in, in the program, where you said that buildings that are, have been built purely because they are useful, as it were, mm. in the way that art is not necessarily yeah. useful, end up being useless. Yes, they absolutely. end up being empty. They end up having graffiti scored all over yeah. them. No one wants to be near them. Exactly. I think that uh, that's where the first lesson that you learn when you begin to study the philosophy of beauty is that uh, there is a utility in the useless. Mm. Uh, and that uh, you ha we, that's what we most need to cultivate in our own lives as well. We don't become lovable objects by being useful. Mm. Um, although we do should lend our help to others and so on, but we, 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 should, we become lovable through enjoying the world mm. and radiating our appreciation of it. Mm. And that is something that we look for in, beauty, in buildings too. Uh, and, you know, um, I always take Paris as an example, partly because it is uh, so, uh, so obviously a perf uh, you know, a wonderful thing, but also because it's always under threat. Mm. You know, poor Notre Dame was going to have some ghastly uh, <laughs> shell but designed by Norman Foster stuck on it, I imagine, in the end. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there, there you see all around you th this sense that things are there because because they are what people wanted to put yeah, there. Yeah. Um, mm. Just like in a, an arranged room, uh, and it, the doors open into agreeable spaces, the windows open onto the street properly, and you are there uh, as though among friends, even though those friends are made of stone. The, there is a sense, surely, if you look at the art world in particular, or architecture, there's a sort of sense in which uh, the belief is, is that truth is ugly, 
you know, mm. ugliness is more truthful. Yes. This is the sort of thing you get told a lot, you know, yeah. if you... Uh, yes, and that was... Um, the, the idea being that, that you become truthful by, uh, uh, as it were, repudiating things, mm. yeah. Show, yeah. showing that... Uh, that uh, um, showing the world as it is, and the world as it is is a horrible world, but that's what the artist should be doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not finding something to love, but finding something to, th to, you know, to push in your face and say, mm. uh, this is part of you too. Now sometimes that, that, that can have a, a, um, an important role in art. Um, you know, it's no, obviously we all know that the rite of spring is about something extremely ugly, mm. the sacrifice, sacrificial death of a, mm. of a, of a girl um, in the grip of the most appalling primitive uh, superstitions. Mm. But it is one of the most beautiful mm. um, things <laughs> ever mm. composed. Mm. Um, it's, as I say, it redeems that death. Mm. It isn't about saying that this, the world is just as horrible as this, it's saying that no, even in these horrible things, mm. uh, there is a redemption, and here is the music that shows you that. Mm. So, it, uh, uh, I, I think that tr the true artist, he may he may mess around with these uh, nasty things, but it's in order to uh, to show that they are not intrinsically nasty, yes. that they that they, they contain the seeds of a real humanity, uh, and you know, a, a real artist will go to the edge of what is intolerable and still bring you back. Some people like Dr. Johnson thought that, that um, <coughs> Shakespeare went to the edge in King's, King Lear and fell over it. <laughs> and so he rewrote the end to bring us back. And you know, there's some truth in that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, I, I think we must recognize that the, ho the whole idea of tragedy is about the way in which art can redeem the, the human condition mm. by, by, by looking the most awful things in the face. Mm. I think uh, sometimes when you look at uh, the, the situation now in the art world, for example, it, you can kind of lose hope, and, mm. but then something happens. And for example, I went recently to the Portrait Gallery's Portrait Award, mm. and it was full of people, some, some of the work was extraordinarily talented, yes. beautiful craftsmanship, oh, no. and, and you thought somehow these people must have slip through the net. Well, <laughs> that, that, that they have, because remember, the, the, the awful thing about works of visual art is you can own them. Mm. And then mm. the Saatchi types come mm. in and bid for them. Mm. Uh, and then they're told by the critics, you must bid for this because it's really hi hideous. Mm. And that, that will be a prized possession. So that we're constantly bidding up ugliness. Mm. Uh, and those old-fashioned portrait painters, you know, uh, uh, who exhibit at the Royal Academy Summer mm. yeah. Exhibition and so on, they are pushed into the corner as you know, sort of, you know, they're sweet, but they're, uh, but it's it's just bland. Yes, uh, uh, yes. and uh, doesn't challenge, doesn't you know, doesn't get to the the, the 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 mystery of the human condition and all this that things, that those sort of things. Now, my view is that actually it does often get to the mystery of the human condition more effectively than, say, Andy Warhol, I actually see you're looking at. Uh, Indeed, I have got that there, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, you know, who, in my view, was a totally trivial character yeah. who happened to make a splash. Yes. Uh, and yes. this splash sold. Now, in the case of music, you know, where you can't actually own the result, there's a, a countervailing force that yeah. says, you know, uh, um, since I can't possess this, the only way I can appreciate it is by listening to it. Yeah. And then, of course, critical judgment comes in and gradually, uh, after a few horrible things uh, clamoring in your ears, you come round to recognize that in music there has to be beauty too. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and we have emerging composers you know, like James Macmillan and David mm. Matthews and so on who are writing the sort of music that people actually want to listen to. Exactly. So, and I think that there's the atelier movement in, in, in representational painting which is trying to do the same. Uh, it's just that the art schools are full of people who, who are not capable of actually teaching the techniques of <laughs> representational painting. They can teach you to make a splash and put your ego on display. Mm. And therefore, they invent all kinds of curricula, which are about putting your ego on display, even if you have no real ego 
that would fit the bill. It is all really about me, isn't yeah, it? It's, that's, 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 what it's the whole, that's what it's uh, about. And uh, unfortunately, that's uh, our celebrity culture. Yeah. Um, that's one of the, we, we didn't talk about this when talking about politics, but that is one of the problems with politics. Yeah. That because of the celebrity culture, because of, you have to be photogenic and appear on TV and everything, mm. uh, the me concept begins to dominate politics too. Mm. And I think um, we are lucky that uh, that it hasn't really dominated this current uh, attempt to find a leader of the yeah, Conservative yes. Party, which is good. But you know, I think they'd be on to a hiding to nothing as well, actually. <laughs> but well, <yes. laughs> um, you mentioned there about. Uh, how the maybe the art world repudiated its traditional forms, whatever. Um, maybe a bit of a clunky segue here, but I'm going back to 1968 mm. when you were in Paris, and I remember that the, the, the French um, they tend to be much more open about talking about cultural issues. And I remember, mm. I think it was Sarkozy who was talking about we have got to. Uh, the the 68 generation must not keep apologising. It must not keep repudiating our greatness or whatever. Yes. And you have called this the culture of repudiation, I yes. believe. I, which is it's where we essentially appear to want to disown and indeed hate yeah. everything about ourselves. Do you think, in the f 50 years that you've been writing and and everything that you've been doing, that that it is the situation there is better now or or worse? Because it seems to me that we are in one of the peaks of sort of repudiation at the moment. Well, I, I, yes and no. I think when I first began publishing as a conscious conservative, with the meaning of conservatism, which I published, I can't remember, 1969 or something, mm. um, <clears throat> the uh, it was the case that, that all I got was incredible attacks. Mm. Um, and then later I, I wrote Thinkers of a New Left, which was <coughs> more or less the end of my academic career. People just wouldn't, uh, just thought that I was completely on the margin of everything in, in attacking people like Foucault and Sartre mm. and all that. But um, now I, I, I get let, uh, emails all the time saying, you know, thanking me for, for my writings yes. and saying that this is inspiring, I think we we can all get together and do something mm. about this. And so I think that there is certainly a, a kind of moment of awakening, uh, if you like, awakening against the woke. Um, do you think that is happening? I think it is happening among serious people <clears throat> and not only middle-aged people, lots of young people mm. uh, uh, write to me about things. Like that. My little film on beauty which you referred to you know, that's had, a, uh, I don't know, it had a million views before the BBC took it down in outrage. Um, you can still see it on Vimeo. Yes, exactly, with Portuguese mm. subtitles. That's had about a million views, I think. Mm. And uh, I get a lot of stuff from young people about that, saying, thank you, you've, so, you've helped me. Mm. Uh, um, you've helped me get away from the cult of ugliness. Mm. And, um, okay, that's only my personal narrative, but... Uh, I, I think one mustn't lose faith in human nature. One must, but at the same time, recognise that civilizations decline, that we, we, we can lose things and never get them back, mm. as our ancestors did, mm. you know, in the Dark Ages. Mm. Uh, but there were those self-sacrificing monks who kept the lamp burning, and it did come back. I, su I suppose in a more, on an almost more prosaic level, I was thinking, here are the sort of 68ers who, who I would say on the whole are in charge of the show now. Mm. You know, they're the seniors now. And the general drift of society, regardless of the government, appears leftward always. Yes. There's got to come a point where, you know, all of these people who are placed in all of these positions, for you briefly for a moment, which was most unusual, but how do we change that? How do, mm. What is the plan for changing that? Um, one should never forget that one's greatest friend in this life is death. And, um, right. you know, uh, they'll all go. <laughs> and you have to prepare what, their successor. Okay. Uh, and they're all, there are also um, moments of the repudiation of the repudiation. Right. 
And I think we've seen this to a great extent in France, uh, a recovery of the sense of the French cultural identity. You don't find in France the adulation of Foucault and Derrida and, yeah. and Lacan and all that that you find in American universities. They, um, most French intellectuals will say, yeah, that had its day, but you know, it was pretty narcissistic, wasn't it? Mm. Um, uh, so, and there's always something new. Do you know, uh, that's really given me some hope, actually. Mm. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us, actually, Sir Rogers. Thank you for that mm. time thank and for you. that very, very optimistic ending. Thank you very, very much uh, for watching So What You're Saying Is, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you very much.